name's Chris and I repair my own audio equipment and I also show you how to repair yours. So let's get started. This Sony TAE88B repair and restoration was quite a challenge. Broken artwork, having to install new components and rework the old. So let's get started. I had just about every issue that you could have in one unit. So no matter what vintage audio equipment you may have, a preamp, an amplifier, a receiver, a tuner, or whatever brand it is, whether it's a Pioneer, a Marantz, a Sansui, a Macintosh, or some other one, this video will help you repair or restore it. I'll show you how to approach various issues that you may have with your vintage audio equipment. It doesn't have to be a Sony preamp. It can be any piece of equipment. This Sony TAE88B had jumper wires in it, had broken artwork, it had damaged eyelets. I'll explain in detail how to disassemble the unique switch assemblies in this Sony TAE88B. In addition, I'll show you how to troubleshoot a problem in one of two channels, like I had in this TAE88B. Along with that, I'll explain the tools that I use to repair and restore vintage audio equipment, from the basic tools like a soldering iron or a multimeter to more advanced tools like a desoldering tool, an oscilloscope, or a semiconductor tester. I'll walk you through the schematic of this TAE88B and explain how to troubleshoot a problem without knowing how to read a schematic well, how to narrow down an issue to a specific area of the unit so the issue can be more easily found. I'm going to show you how to find the parts that you need for any type of electronic equipment that you may have, not just vintage audio equipment, I work on vintage audio equipment, but what I'm going to show you is how to find the parts to repair any piece of vintage electronics that you may have. I'm going to throw in my two cents, my personal opinion, about electronic parts that are being made in China, and if that matters. So I'm going to throw in my own personal opinion about that. And on top of that, I've even included a very interesting video on the history of the Sony Corporation. I have years of personal experience that I'm going to show you here in a short period of time. I hope you enjoy it. This is a long video and I put chapters into this video, time codes, and some of you all may know how that works, some of you may not. But on a video like this one that's two plus hours long, you may not want to watch it all. I hope you do. I hope you want to watch it from beginning to end. But you may not want to. So I've put chapters into this video and hopefully given you some descriptions of what those chapters contain. So what you do when you're at the video is hit that show more button and scroll down and down right at the bottom you're going to see where I put time codes in and then there's chapters that correlate to those time codes. I want to go over a little bit with you about the Sony TAE88B preamplifier. It's one of my favorites. For whatever reason Sony didn't get much traction back in the day when I was purchasing this equipment in the 70s and into the early 80s, but every Sony piece I have is just an amazing piece of equipment. I don't know why they didn't get traction. Matter of fact, I don't even remember looking at them back in the day. I looked at Pioneer and Sansui and Marantz and all the names you hear about, but somehow I didn't see Sony very much or didn't pay attention to it if I did see it. But this preamplifier is one of the finest pieces of vintage equipment I have. It was produced from 1977 to 1984 and is really full featured. It has two phono inputs, an auxiliary input, a tuner input, 
and two tape inputs. As I mentioned, this TAE88B has two phono inputs. And a neat thing about this preamp is it has a head amplifier built into it. And that's used with moving coil cartridges to amplify them to a point where this preamplifier can use them. And you can use that head amplifier on either Phono 1 or Phono 2, which is really a great feature to have if you have a moving coil cartridge. And even better, in this TAE88, this head amplifier is the Sony HA55 which was a state-of-the-art head amplifier back in the day and still today they bring four or five or six hundred dollars by themselves on eBay when you can find them so it's just a nice feature to have built right into this preamp what I do and what you should do with any unknown piece of audio equipment is first just give it a look Take a look at the front of it, take a look at the back of it, take a look at the top and the bottom of it, and also go ahead and remove the covers. And, and just take a, a look and see if you see anything wrong. If you recall my last video on the uh, Technics uh, SC9600P power amplifier, I found a screw in the bottom of the uh, amplifier. And so you could avert a disaster, a possible disaster, uh, just by taking a look. So you should always look at your equipment before you start. Everything looked fine. So I powered up the preamp. It seemed to power up fine. And then I started to use the controls, do a little bit of testing with it. And the output level control, I would move it and I would get different volume levels out of different sides. The same with the mode control. I'd move that, maybe lose one side, maybe lose the other if I move the tape monitor. And it acted consistently flaky. Does that make any sense? Well, it may. Usually, you guys are familiar with these controls that are noisy and, you know, you'll hear static and you'll lose your channel or lose volume, but you, you keep playing with it and it'll come back. This was extremely consistent about when I put it in a certain position, it was always the same defect. It didn't, it wasn't flaky at all. I put it at 0 dB and I would lose part of my volume in the left channel. I, I would flip the switch back and forth, back and forth, you know, thinking it was going to act flaky again, and it didn't act flaky. It was always the same way. What was happening with the output level control at 0 dB, I was actually down 10 dB in the left channel, but the right channel worked. When I went to minus 10 dB, they both seemed to be even, like they both were at minus 10 dB. I went to minus 20 dB, and I had full output, like it was at 0 dB in the right channel. And then when I turned it off, I had some reduced volume in the left channel. And I could repeat this over and over. I could just keep flicking this switch back and forth, back and forth. It wasn't flaky at all. Every single time, uh, I moved it into a position, I got the exact same result, which is not the norm. Normally you get all kinds of flaky results. This was like as solid as a rock. It was as solid as a rock that none of those switch positions worked correctly, but they worked. So from there, it's like, okay, what's that all about? Then it was like, okay, I've got to find out what's going on with this output level control before I move on to the other ones. The other ones were flaky too, <laughs> in different ways, but you got to start somewhere. So I'm going to start with that output level control. Now it's time to find out why this output level switch is not operating properly. The first order of business is to download the service manual from HiFiEngine.com. Once again, I've said it before, but it's a wonderful resource for vintage audio documentation. And in this unit's case, the service manual gives you a lot of mechanical information that you will need if you try to disassemble this unit. 
it'd be very difficult to get this unit apart without the details that are provided in the service manual to get it apart correctly and also back together correctly and a lot of that has to do with those cams that are in these switches. These are not the normal switches that you see in most vintage audio equipment. They're special and so they all have s certain positions they need to be in when they're reinstalled and it's very important also and you'll see later uh, even though I did follow the instructions you'll see that they make a note of one area about joint uh, removal and they tell you how to do that so a spring does not come apart between two pieces well guess what sometimes things happen and that spring came apart on me even following the instructions things can go wrong sometimes as I started working on this preamp I noticed something that I didn't see initially and that was under the bottom cover there are two jumper wires that were put in at some point I'm not sure what that's about when I initially powered it up the switches acted flaky so I'm not sure what's happening there this is not that terribly unusual uh, when you're working on equipment that's 40 50 years old other people have worked on it so we'll just have to see what that's all about before going on with the restoration I want to show you a little bit of the history of the Sony Corporation. Uh, this is a corporate video that they shot. I'm not really sure when they shot this video, but it looks like something from the 60s or probably the early 70s. For you guys who are interested, there's a lot more of Sony's history on their website. They talk about their founders. They talk about the company they were before Sony. And most interesting, the one thing I wanted to add to this video that's coming up is where they came up with the company name. And here you can see they used two words. Two words. One was the Latin word sunus and the word sunny. And here they explain why they use these words. And the, the word sunus in Latin re represents the words like sound and sonic. The other word sunny means little sun. And I'm just reading here word for word what it says, but it was used in combination. Sony is supposed to represent a very small group of young people who have the energy and passion toward unlimited creations and innovative ideas. Anyway, that's interesting to me, and I wanted to add that because that's not in this next video. And as I mentioned, there's a ton of information on Sony's website. Every detail of their first product, which was a, a rice cooker and on and on and on from 1946 so if you really want to dig deep you can just go to sony.com and look up their history so with that being said I picked this next video because I thought it kind of fit the equipment that's in this video the Sony preamplifier that I'm going over so with that being said here's that Sony video from the late 60s 1970s The history of Sony Corporation dates back to 1946, when Japan was going through a most trying time in the aftermath of World War II. A capital of $527 and a seven-man staff that was, in fact, all the resources we had with which to launch an enterprise. But even in those years, we already had a firm operating principle of opening up new markets with unique new products. The Sony building in Ginza, Tokyo. Its salons are always crowded with many Japanese and visitors from all over the world, enjoying themselves operating and handling various Sony products.
Now, let's review some of the highlights in our pioneering product development efforts. Sony put on the market the first tape recorder in Japan in 1950, the first transistor radio in Japan in 1955, the world's first transistor TV set in 1960, the five-inch micro TV set in 1962, and the world's first all-transistor portable video coda in 1963. The Trinitron color TV developed in 1968 one of our most important technical breakthroughs in recent years. Trinitron system can produce brighter and sharper pictures than the conventional sets and has set a new standard for color TV picture quality. The path we trod was indeed that of a pioneer, always devoted to opening up new technological possibilities. Here at the research center, Sony's scientists are at work to develop the company's advanced technology which should always be in the lead. This is the Sony head office and Shinagawa plant in Tokyo. Here, Sony transistor radios and cassette tape recorders are manufactured. Sony's Trinitron TV assembly factories. This is a Trinitron TV picture tube factory. and a Sony electronic tube factory. Sony's Trinitron assembly factory. Transistor TV sets are being manufactured here at the Color TV factory in Tokyo. Trinitron Color TV Assembly Factory in Central Japan mass produces Trinitron Color TV sets. Here, the most modern facilities and the newest techniques combine to turn out Sony products of unique high quality. At this factory, also in Central Japan, Trinitron color TV picture tubes are being manufactured. About 35 miles southwest of Tokyo is a semiconductor factory where transistors and diodes, the heart of Sony products, are being mass produced. This plant, about 250 miles north of Tokyo, produces high quality audio and video magnetic recording tapes. The plant is also developing and manufacturing ferrite cores, which are of vital importance as transistor radio and TV parts.
Germany also has a machine shop of its own to produce the parts needed for its new products and also to design and produce production facilities. This machine shop plays a very important role for Sony, the part finder. At another plant in Tokyo, varied lines of audio equipment are being mass produced. The factory is also equipped with facilities for manufacturing the video coda, a product which is of prime importance in the electronics industry. The work at assembly lines is efficiently carried out with superb team spirit. At each working place, the leader's plans and instructions are promptly and smoothly conveyed to each member there and carried out precisely as intended. Facing up to challenge after challenge in the product development and improvement efforts, Sony engineers have rounds of discussions. Sony attaches great importance to technology, but it values people even more highly. Trying to bring out the best in the individual, the company assists its employees in developing their personnel potentialities to the fullest. This is based on its firm belief that high product quality is the outcome of employees' fully motivated work at the production line. Here at the Sony Gakuen High School, young employees attend classes in their off hours. This officially recognized educational institution offers a science and technology course and a general course. Students at this school are spending fruitful days with Sony, proud of working their way through the high school and materializing what they have learned or acquired into each Sony product. The Sony Kindergarten looks after children aged three to six of married female employees. It is something more than a day nursery. It is an institution where the teachers and mothers do their share for ideal preschool education. Here, English lessons are conducted as well as violin and piano lessons, all on the modernized principle of preschool education. Here is another technological landmark achieved by Sony's research and development staff, the Sony Color Video Cassette System. After stirring up a VTR craze all over the world, with the development of the compact VTR, another world's first, Sony has developed the video cassette 
as a prime product of the future, comparable to the color TV of today. Sony's proven superiority in audio technology. It's video technology that has produced the Trinitron and its excellent all-round research and development staff with great enthusiasm for product development have all combined to produce the video cassette system, opening up a wholly new vista in color video technology. Sony's trademark has been registered in over 170 countries and territories throughout the world. Sony products live up to the confidence of all peoples around the world. Supported by full customer confidence, Sony's extensive network of distribution reaches out to every far corner of the world. Steadily advancing Sony technology knows no bounds, and boundless possibilities are in store for the years ahead. Worldwide Sony. Creative all the time, Sony will make continued all-out efforts to live up to your confidence and expectations. It's time to get back into the Sony TAE-88B restoration. Just before I showed you the Sony corporate history video, I mentioned finding two wires under the chassis that were added at some point. Well, guess what? I found a third one. Who knows how many more I'll find, but there's a third one. And it's over by the phono switches. I'm sure all these were put in to make this unit operate to some point. I'm a little bit confused with the one over on the phono side, as someone had been in here before and wrote front on one of those cam switches. So that switch has been out, and you can see here on the uh, artwork side of these switches, that these have been removed and put back in. So I'm not sure exactly what that's all about. I can see why somebody may have put a jumper in, try to get it working, then they realize that those switches needed to be removed and reworked, but why they were put back in and then a jumper was put back in, I'm not sure, other than maybe the artwork looks damaged here. So maybe they damaged the artwork and when they got done, they put this wire in. But that's another thing I'm gonna to have to look at down the line and see what happened with that. It's very important to assess any issues that you have with vintage equipment before you start trying to work on it because you're going to find out over time through experience that sometimes you're the one that put an issue into the equipment. You're moving wires, you're unsoldering pins, you've got your hands on this piece of equipment and you want to make sure that you know where you started from, a known starting point. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to start with that output level control, and I think I used the term uh, inconsistently consistent or something like that about how that was operating. Every time I put it at 0 dB, I got the same result. Every time I put it at minus 10 dB, I got the same result. Minus 20 dB and to the off position of that output level control, I got the exact same results. So I'm going to start with that because I've got to start somewhere. And that's what you have to do. You have to narrow down your issues and start working on one or the other. Or you end up almost like with a Rubik's Cube. You start jumping around from spot to spot and it's going to be much more difficult to repair a piece of equipment. 
one like this that looks like it has multiple issues in it. So again, very important, assess what you've got before you start working on it. So if I have a different issue down the road, I know I did it. There's something happened. I broke a wire. I did something to it because I, I've got a known starting point. So I just wanted to share that with you because that's very important is take the time when you get a piece of vintage stereo equipment, whether it's yours or somebody else's, and go through it as well as you can. First by looking at it like I've done with this preamp, but also going through and testing it. Hook it up. What does it do? What doesn't it do? What does it do consistently? What does it do intermittently? Just so you've got a known starting point. If the piece of equipment hasn't been powered up for years or it's unknown, it's always a good idea to power it up with a Variac. Here I used a Variac with my Moran's 10B tuner and I'll use a Variac or a dim bulb tester or both for any pieces of equipment that I'm unsure about. And it just allows those capacitors that maybe haven't been powered up for years to not get slammed with that full line voltage. Now it's time to find out why this output level switch is not operating properly. As I move the output level control into different positions at the front of the unit, 0 dB, minus 10, minus 20 to off, and you can see here from the top of the unit how those switches and those individual cams, there's four individual cams per switch, which is per channel. So there's eight cams, there's two of these switches with four cams each. And you can see how these move back and forth. Now you can't see too much detail here, and I'm going to show some detail of what these particular cams are doing. This is the same switch that you just saw at the top of the unit, more of a close-up view. This is the left channel, and you'll see there's four different cams. And going left to right, you can see this little ball, or what they call link, up in that cam. You can see that moving. Now the third and the fourth switch element, going left to right, you never see that little ball or that link. So that is an issue. And now here's the right hand one. And if you take a look again, looking left to right, that first one, you never see it. You never see that little ball or link. Now on element two, three, and four, you see it working what looks to be normal. So those two switch elements are working differently. Now here, what I've done, I've slowed this up a little bit, just so you can look through it again a little bit closer. And this is the left channel, and you see those first two operating. That little link element, that little ball is being pushed by the cam. And the third and the fourth one isn't. And now here on the right channel, we've got the same thing. That first one, you never see that little link ball. And on the second, third, and fourth one, you can see as those cams move in those elements how that's operating. So there's why the two channels are acting different, because the two switch assemblies are acting different. Now understanding why the output level control was different on each channel, now what do I have to do to fix this? And it's obvious I'm going to have to take those switches out of this preamp. There's really no way to disassemble those in the preamp. So I'm going to have to remove them and take them apart and figure out why are they not operating. This preamplifier comes apart a little bit differently than most of them to get the face plate off. There were several hex screws I had to loosen and the control knobs actually stay attached to the front panel, so that's a little bit different. So that's why I'd take those hex screws out. I didn't really have any issues. I loosened everything I was supposed to. And the only issue I did have was that spring I mentioned a few minutes ago in the video that it came loose on me. And that type of thing happens uh, sometimes. Sometimes things happen like that. 
and that spring was a little bit of a pain to get back together into the two pieces. What happened was when I undid that hex screw, it took the tension off that spring. It just fell apart in one half or the other. I don't know which one, but it didn't really matter. It was apart. And this is where some experience with tape decks helped me and would help you if you worked on tape decks. There's a lot of little springs in tape decks. I have a lot of little tools that help me uh, with tape decks and springs. So it still took me about 10 minutes to get this uh, spring back where it needed to get. I got the face plate off. A lot of times in these units, and in this unit, I did do this. There's some wiring, such as the LED wiring, and also the power switch wiring that I just cut. I just took a pair of cutters and cut those leads off because you can heat them up, you can remove the solder, but really what you should do is go ahead and strip some new wire and when I put it back together I'll have some new wire to put on there and get a nice fresh solder joint on there. If I was short wire, if the wire wouldn't reach or something, then maybe I would try to remove it and uh, not cut it off. But just cut it right down by the pin and then I'll remove that excess solder off and then I'll just strip some new wire and put it back together. Now we'll begin to remove the switches and once again I'm going to mention my desoldering tool but it makes a somewhat difficult job extremely easy. Just watch how easy this is to do with a tool like this. A desoldering tool like this just makes this job so much easier and safer for the equipment. And you go ahead and as I showed here, I just picked the chassis up and I pulled the switch out from the top of the unit. And it's a pretty easy thing to do. Now with the switch out of the unit, put it down here on the test bench and take a closer look at it and see exactly what is causing those little switches not to operate correctly. So now I have the switch assembly out in front of me. I've removed it from the chassis and I can just take a look at it and see what I've got. Be honest with you, I'm not a mechanical genius, but I've worked on this stuff enough to know you ought to look it over first before you just try to tear it apart and worry about what happens later. So I'm just looking it over here and what I've also done is you'll see little black marks. I've taken magic marker and marked the top of each of those little cams because as I indicated in the service manual they talk about you need to mark those cams in some manner if you take this apart. So I marked them and later on I can just remove that with some alcohol. It looks like the four cams come out separately. There's a tab for each one so I'll take them one at a time. I'm going to go ahead and uh, bend the tab straight and that looks like that will allow this assembly to be removed out of the, out of the switch. And then I turned it back over and there's a little cover, what appears to be a cover. Uh, there's four of them that cover each of those cams. And so now I'm bending the pins flat to where I believe that cover will come off. And then I don't know what I'm going to get. I guess the switch will come apart. I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what will happen at this point. So I pulled the cover and it came off and now I can see the inside of the switch assembly. I can see that link or that ball that was uh, stuck and I can see some other part of it. I'm not sure what I'm looking at at this point. So now I'm going to try to remove that entire 
cam out of that out of that switch assembly and I've loosened the tab at the top and I've got the cover off here at the bottom so I think it just comes loose and sure enough it does I'm pretty sure I see what the issue is and it involves old grease and sure enough that's what's going on here these are all gummed up uh, this will not spring back like it should as I move this it's freeing up some but that's the problem yeah it's better but that's got to be cleaned out it's a lot like I said like tape decks this old grease just starts to uh, harden up and it gets more like glue than a lubricant over time see it, it stuck that time for me right down there won't quite pop back and that's all this old um, this old grease in here see this is the reason why this isn't springing back because right now this should be all the way pushed back here like this and so you can see this little ball out as soon as I press this ball like the cam would be doing the cam would be pressing this ball in I'll do it here in my screwdriver can I even push it in yeah I can push it in but you can see it's stuck it's not springing back I push this in and it won't spring back so what that is is this is all gummed up so what I've got to do is take this piece out uh, take the spring out now what you always want to be careful this spring does not look like it's under a lot of pressure doesn't look that way but when I take this piece out I've got to be aware that this spring could want to go flying so what I'll do is I'll just put my finger over the spring that way it can't go anywhere if something something happens unexpected and let me see if I can get this piece out of here uh. yeah Uh, there she is so I got the spring don't want to lose that you think a spring well uh, if I lose it I'll just get another spring well sometimes that works sometimes that don't work it's amazing how these springs have just certain tensions and it's hard even if you find one that looks similar to actually be the same so I'm going to clean up all this old grease on here and uh, then apply a little bit of new grease. You can see, I can see it, and it's just hardened. It's a lot like a tape deck. It's just hardened up. This image shows you at the top all of the pieces that are within each of these switches. There's four of these four different cams and four different of the switch units and down below shows you the whole switch the complete switch with two of the units removed and two still installed now I'll get that old grease cleaned up as I mentioned before this is a lot like old tape decks almost all the mechanical issues in tape decks are, are caused by the same issue just gummed up old grease so I'll clean that up with some alcohol it's gonna take a little while here there's a lot to a lot of switches to clean up but it's just gotta be done and also there's some contacts some gold contacts in this switch seeing it is a switch and I'm gonna clean those up with some deoxid gold spray that I just sprayed onto a q-tip why not clean those up I've got it all apart 
Is it an issue? I don't know that it is, but while I'm here, what's it take me? You know, another few seconds just to do this. And then we've got to get that new grease applied, and then I can start reassembling the switches. I'm ready now to reassemble the switches. I've got them all cleaned up. There's a little metal clip that has to be installed. I showed that in the picture of the entire switch being disassembled. That has to be put in there because that's what makes the contacts within this switch. So now I'll put it back into the case along with that little metal clip. Now the spring, I'll put the spring in. We've got to be careful again that uh, it doesn't go flying. Just kind of have your finger there, get ready. This one wasn't under a lot of tension, but you've just got to be ready for that. And now I'll test it a little bit, make sure that seems to be moving smoothly. And it seems to be moving smooth. So now I'll put the base back on, and there's little contact points that go down into that clip that I just showed. And that has to be centered on there just right because that clip's got to go onto those pins. And then what I'll do is I want to make sure it's working before I actually clip it back together. I'll go ahead and put that link back in, that, that, that piece that the cam rides on and I'll test it. If you can see down toward the bottom of the switch, you can see the uh, contacts moving back and forth. Before I completely reassemble the switch and reinstall it, I want to make sure that each of these are working correctly. I don't want to get this all back together and then have to pull it out because there's a problem. So I'm going to test each of these to make sure they're working correctly before I solder them back in. Now with the left channel output switch done, I'll do the same thing to the right channel output switch. So I'll go ahead and remove that now and do the exact same thing that I did to the left channel switch. Once again, my desoldering tool making a somewhat difficult job extremely easy. You go ahead and unsolder those pins. And then I just lifted up the chassis a little bit. And then I pulled the switch assembly out uh, from the top of the unit. And now I'll go ahead and rework the switch assembly just like I did on the left channel. Now I've got the right channel switch here on the test bench. And as I've mentioned before in my projects, a lot of this has to do with experience. And now I have a little bit of experience with this switch because I already worked on the left channel switch. So I know what to expect when I open it up and how to open it up and what the best way to open it up is. So on the right channel, what I'm going to do I found the best way is to just take all four of those individual switches that are within that case and just remove them right on out of the case. Don't even worry about taking that bottom piece off. As I said before, I wasn't sure what I was going to run into every step of the way. Now I am. So I'll take all four of these switches out of the case and then I'll rework them. There's no need to take that bottom piece off with them in the case. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and as I indicated clean up that old grease and get these switches ready for their next 30 or 40 years.
cleaned up the switches, then reassembled everything, went back through the same procedure I did on that left channel one, went and made sure that it was going to work before I went back, soldered it in, hooked everything back up, and then having an issue. I checked everything out. Everything looks good. So I think we're ready to reinstall both the left and the right channel output level controls. So now I'm going to reinstall the reworked switches back into the preamp. Uh, it's pretty just straightforward. Just put them right back in like you took them out and go ahead and solder them in. And I'm going to put the left one in first. And then after I do that, I'm going to go ahead and put the right switch back in. But I'm not going to hook this all back up. I'm pretty confident the switches are all right. But you may recall from earlier in the video that I had some jumper wires that were jumpered across some of the other switches. And I'm going to figure out what's going on with them. Although probably what's going on with them is the same thing that we had here, which was gummed up grease. This switch is also defective. And so what I think happened is that this was jumpered so at least you could play the source. I'm assuming this one's got the same issue with the grease. The old grease is just gummed up. So I'm going to take this guy out now. Okay, I've got the selector switch out. Um, you can see again that uh, it's really this last switch right here that has the issue. So I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing I did before. Take this apart and uh, get it cleaned up. With the switches reworked and reinstalled, I went ahead and gave it a try. And now the output level worked correctly, both channels. In addition, the mode selector, it worked correctly. Everything worked well there. And that tape monitor source switch was working, working well. So I was getting closer. Now, I don't mention the phono switches, because that's a story in itself. Uh, that's a video in itself. And that's coming up here shortly. But I had several issues with the phono section that took quite a bit of troubleshooting. Before I show you what it took to repair the phono section of this preamplifier, I thought it was a good time to talk about some more tools that I use and that helped immensely with the issues that I was having with this preamplifier. So I have my Tektronix uh, 465B oscilloscope out, wanted to show you today. I have a more modern um, oscilloscope also, a digital one. But I tell you, if you guys just getting in to maybe wanting to repair electronics just in general, uh, the Tektronix scopes, the old Tektronix scopes are just wonderful pieces. This guy here is about 40 years old. He's not new. I purchased him on eBay. Oh boy, I don't know. At least 10 years ago. Maybe longer than that. And this one has a built-in digital Maldi meter up here. And then it is a two-channel uh, scope that just works well for any type of vintage equipment. These were big bucks back in the day. And on eBay you know, you find one used, they're going to be two, three hundred dollars. Uh, another thing that this one came with, which is nice, the probes for the digital Maldi meter. You may be able to see this, you may not, but this probe is completely insulated all the way up to the tip. And then there's something the size of a needle here on the end. Whether you can see that or not, 
Um, I don't know, but it's just just think of a needle. It's right to a point like that. And so the good thing about that is when you're over here probing inside this equipment, you still have to be careful. That's the biggest danger here in any of the solid state equipment is you shorting something together that you shouldn't because these solid state components like diodes and transistors, they are not happy about that at all. You're probably more inclined to hurt yourself in a piece of tube equipment. So I just wanted to bring up the point about a vintage uh, oscilloscope as an option for you guys. You know, you get the scope, you get the digital meter built into it. They're great scopes. These cost as much as it says cars did back in the day. Now the only thing against a 40 year old piece of electronics is what? It's 40 years old. So how long is it going to work? Even if you buy it working, you know you're taking a gamble on it. But it, it's a great piece of equipment to work on uh, vintage audio with. The next tool I use quite often is my Peak Atlas DCA Pro which tests transistors, it'll test MOSFETs, It'll test diodes. Um, it'll test LEDs. It's, a, it's really a handy tool. And one of the most handy things about it are it's great if you need to gain match transistors. In some areas of stereo equipment, gain matching is quite important. And this device does a pretty good job doing that. It also has curve tracing. If you want to hook it to your PC, it's got software that's included with it. And so it'll do a lot. And it's about $150 or so. So it's one of those items. Is it the first item I would pick up? If I was first starting out with this, uh, no, probably not. Because you can test transistors and test diodes and MOSFETs to some extent with your multimeter. But this is just a very handy uh, piece of equipment. It's also very handy to identify what you have. If you're not sure what the component is, it'll tell you if it's NPN, PNP, etc. So it's a pretty handy piece to have, and I'm glad I've got it, and I use it pretty often. Of course, you can do a lot with just a portable digital multimeter, like I was showing earlier when I was working on the uh, switches for this preamp. So... You don't have to have an oscilloscope. You don't have to have an Atlas Peak DCA Pro to troubleshoot. Those two tools are just very helpful to make it more efficient to troubleshoot. But one thing you need to have is at least a small portable digital multimeter. Not a $3 one from the flea market, but it doesn't have to be a $500 fluke meter. But get on Amazon, $30, $40, $50 digital multimeter will probably work out fine for you. And I wanted to show you guys also, this is something else that you can do that really is convenient and helpful if you guys ever get into repairing this equipment. Now I have a, an iMac sitting here on my test bench. You can use any computer. This just happens to be a, an Apple uh, computer. But what I do is I store all of my service manuals and schematics and just information in general on my network. I have a little small little home network like I'm sure many of you guys do. I'll go down here and I know I've got the... Uh, the Sony TAE88B right here. So this looks like what we want. And there we go. So we'll blow that up once we get down to the pages we need. There we go. Well, actually, this looks a little better anyway, right? So I think we can just blow this up a little bit. Let's scroll down. We want to blow it up one more. I don't know if we do or not, but we can try it. Yeah, I guess we do. I hope these previous tips of the equipment I use and how I access my documentation helps you troubleshoot your piece of equipment. So now I'm going to start working on that phono section and start troubleshooting that. When I hooked up a turntable, 
I had no output from the right channel whatsoever. It was completely dead. So I went ahead and took a look and did all the simple things that I could do. And it was obvious this was going to take uh, quite a bit more troubleshooting than just seeing what was wrong. As I said, it was going to take more than seeing what was wrong, but with that being said, I certainly did see things that were wrong. So I'm going to go over those first. If you've made it this far in the video, you've seen me remove and repair several of these switches in this preamp. And I'm going to be removing the phono switches also. The difference here is somebody has already removed these. So I'm going to have to remove both the left and the right one. And the bad news is I can tell these eyelets have been damaged. And even though I'm going to be using my desoldering tool, which helps me immensely to reduce the damage, I'm still going to probably do additional damage because these eyelets are in very, very bad shape even before I hit them with a 800 degree soldering iron. So I'm going to go ahead. I mean, I have to do it. I have to remove them. I, I have no choice because these switches have an issue just like the other ones did. But in this case, unfortunately, there's going to be some damage to the artwork. So I'm going to go ahead here and that's what I'm doing. I'm going to take these out and just going to have to deal with what I've got to deal with when I get these out. I've got the left channel's phono switch out and I'm going to try to show you here what may be happening with it. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to show you. And I'm going to try to show you what the issue is with that one switch. Why it's staying open or what I think the issue is before I open this switch up. I, I don't know that you're going to be able to see this. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. But you remember that link, that little ball, what I call that little blue ball that you push? And then the switch, there's a little metal bar that contacts these pins. Either it's contacting this middle pin and the pin to the left or the middle pin and the pin to the right. And what's happening here, when I push this, it's moving smooth enough. That's not the issue. It's moving very smooth. But what it's doing is as I push and almost as I get it completely pushed in, it jumps. I can see internally there's kind of like it's jumping and that little metal piece is probably losing contact. Maybe this plate, maybe, I'm not sure, I can't quite tell, is not flush down here. I'm going to have to loosen this up. Or... It's not flush, and then when you push this, this mechanism has a little room to move. And it moves up and down instead of sideways like it should. Okay, I've got it opened up, and what the issue is, that little bottom plate is broken. I don't know if you can see that. I don't want to break the whole thing in half here. You might be able to see the warp in it. But that is broke. It snapped. So there we go. That's why this was kind of the little, this piece here that sits down in the case has that little metal clip that slides back and forth on those pins. And so this guy's cracked. And what's happening, right, every time you move it, it just kind of moves a little bit. Always something, right? I mean, but you learn from this kind of stuff. By me taking those other switches apart that didn't have this issue, I was able to take this switch apart that uh, someone else had taken apart and not got it back together correctly. But I think what I can do here is go ahead and clean this up. It's still attached. Um, it's just about broke. 
off here but go ahead and get this um, grease cleaned up and then I'm going to take a little little touch of super glue just a little touch there and I think that'll hold it fine you know this thing weighs about uh, a half a gram there's just nothing nothing to it at all so I'll go ahead and clean that up and glue it up give it a little time to set and uh, then put it back together and give it a try so after gluing the plate together and letting it sit up for a little while I went ahead and tested it on the uh, test bench before I reassembled it looks like it was working fine and so I went and I reassembled the switch and I'll go ahead and reinstall it even though I fixed the switch and I'm confident in the switch as I showed a little while ago those eyelets are in terrible shape and I'm not sure how good of a connection I've got from these switches to the artwork on these boards so as I also indicated my issue another one of the issues is that there is no no audio from the right channel in the phono so what I'm going to do to troubleshoot I'm gonna jumper over those switches I'm gonna bypass those switches and this is what you need to do I feel when you're troubleshooting a problem if you've got multiple problems you've got to narrow it down and right now I'm pretty confident in the switches but I'm not so confident in the artwork and so I'm gonna jumper right over those switches and what I'm going to do is with a signal generator I'm gonna run a 20 millivolt sine wave a thousand Hertz sine wave into the phono RCA inputs of this preamp and as I just said I'm gonna jumper the switch and I'm going to put that signal straight in to the phono section without it having to go through those switches so the switches at the front of the unit will have no effect I'm going to jump her right over those because I know I have another issue besides these switches and is that to do with that artwork uh, that obviously has been damaged maybe maybe not and I'm gonna find that out and I've mentioned to you you guys before about how you can troubleshoot an issue even if you don't know a lot about what's going on and this is a good example of that if you're not able to read a schematic well let's say or you just don't know where to start uh, this is a good way to approach it now you do need an oscilloscope for this you need some sort of a signal generator I'm gonna turn the signal generator on so now we should have 20 millivolts coming into the RCA inputs I'm gonna use my two scope probes here uh, what I do and you can do it different ways you should always ground the the uh, the the scope probe that you're using and usually a spot on the chassis is good and what I do I usually run a jumper from the chassis somewhere and I jumper the two together I don't know if you can tell but there's a lot of room I've got them actually jumpered the grounds jumpered together but you've got a lot of room here to play with so I want to use the let's see I want to use channel one for the left channel and I'll use channel two for the right so I'm gonna go right on first of all make sure that we got the signal we need to get started I'm gonna put the probes right here on that jumper wire I put on all right and I don't know if you can see this but here we've got the two signals the 20 millivolt sine wave it's a thousand Hertz I'm putting into it we know we've got a signal coming in to both sides and we're gonna and we're gonna trace this through and see where we're losing that right channel phono signal somewhere we are because she's deader in a doornail I mean nothing not low volume not any volume and as I mentioned earlier I think when I uh, tested the phono section 
I tested both cartridges. I tested a moving magnet cartridge that I have and I also tested a moving coil cartridge to make sure that it wasn't something to do with the head amp only. Okay, now I'm going to look at that schematic. I know I've got it coming in, right? We're looking at that on the scope. So I'm going to right off the bat assume that it's not the head amps issue, although it could be. But I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go to what they call the main board, which is where this signal comes into and it's actually it's amplified it's the it actually it's the phono eq amp of the um, preamp right i mean they do this eq thing with the uh when they make albums and you've got to get the uh and any preamplifier has to have a phono eq in it to um so you can listen to your albums. So it's actually the Phono EQ amp that I'm going to look at with it coming in. And that's going to... Uh, it looks like it's Q201. And it's the gate. This is a, this is a, a FET, not a transistor. So it looks like the gate... Uh, the signal comes into. So the gate of 201. So uh, let's pick our one that we know our good channel first, which is the left channel. A gate of 201. And many times in, in this unit is the same. If you look under here, if you look down here um, at the bottom of the board, it indicates, you probably can't see this, but it has all the transistor numbers. And I believe uh, it doesn't have the capacitors, but it looks like all the transistors are marked and the FETs are marked. Uh, and as I indicated, I think, that the left channel's numbers are 50 below the right channel. So if you look at the schematic and it says 201 for the left channel, which is what they show you on the schematic, to look at that same pin, that to look at that same component on the right channel, it would be designated 251, so add 50. So I said 201, the gate. And they show here um, on this, they call it Q, Q201. They have a D for drain. G for gate, uh, S for source. So let's see if I can get the probe on here. And once again, I'm just going to touch this. I'm not going to try to hook this probe on, but this is pretty tight. You don't want to short stuff in here. So you've got to kind of rest. I've rested my arm on the scope. That helps me steady my arm. And I'm going to just reach in and touch that gate. And what do you know? It's this top sine wave here. So this is coming in to this FET on the main board correctly on the left channel, which is what we probably expected, right? Most likely, because it's working. Now the right channel, we're not so sure. And remember, I was on 201 on the gate, and here I want to be on 251 on the gate. So, let's see here. And look at that. It looks like it's there. Okay. Now that looks pretty darn good too, doesn't it? That's channel two. And let's go over here to, uh, or I say channel two. It's really the right channel. All right. That looks like a nice sine wave, too. So let's just go over here again and give it another eyeball. Oh, yeah, they're identical. They're identical. Yeah, they're identical. Exactly the same. So that shows you... So that shows you that 
getting to this main, what they call the main board, which is the Phono EQ amp, we're good. Left and right channel are good. So we're losing it somewhere further on. But this is how you break things down. First, I figured out that the CD player worked through the aux, right? So that eliminated a lot of this preamp. And then I tested out the, um, the phono function. That didn't work. And I found out the right channel didn't work. But this is what you do. This is what makes something daunting possible to work on. Because when you first look at this thing, you think, good, you know, w w where do I start? I don't even know where to start. But this is how you start narrowing it down. So I know now that up to this point, we're good to go. So something else is wrong from here out. And we don't have a whole lot we do. <laughs> I shouldn't say we don't have a whole lot. We do have a whole lot uh, still where it could be wrong, but we eliminated a whole lot too. So now I'll go on and keep tracing that along and see and see where we lose it at. Well, now I'm going to follow this along here and, and see where we're losing it. Q201 and Q02 are dual packaged FETs. Once again, you got to be careful in here. So I'm kind of like maneuvering around my hands here to be sure I don't short nothing because I got to kind of touch and look, right? So we're going to look at 202 on the gate. We've got a signal and it looks good. On the good on the good channel, right? That's what you want to look at first. Once again, I just want to say that you've got the best helper in the world here, the good channel, right? You can take a look. You're not sure what you're supposed to see. You take a look, and you say, "Well, that channel's working, so that signal must be good." And you go over to the bad channel, and you take a look at the bad channel and see what you have. So I'm going to look at those same two pins. That certainly looks different. Look at all this, uh, you know, and you guys know me, I'm a hobbyist. I'm not an expert at this stuff, right? But what looks to be like this ringing, I don't know if you can see this in this sine wave. And the good side does not have that, the left channel. You just barely see it. Give me a little more intensity here. There. Whoops. Get back on the pin. There. Now take a look at that. There's what you got on the bad channel. Right? It almost looks like a, a boat haul or, or something. You know? There's what you got on the bad one. Look at all that ringing in there. What is that? I don't know. Let me go back to the good channel though. That's quite a difference. Why? Now it's time to keep following that, and why is that happening? Something's different now. Now here, in this section, so we found something different. Coming into this board, we're good. Uh, obviously, just inside here, just in a step or two, of the signal has changed. The issue here, this is where things do, are not always simple. You know, you think, well, I've got it here, I don't have it there. It must be those two parts. Well, not necessarily, because if you look at this schematic, all, this whole section, you know, there's several transistors, several FETs. They're all really tied to each other. And any one of these that have an issue will cause an issue here. So the first thing, though, that you want to do is check the voltages. That's the first thing you want to do. Do we have the right voltages? And as I mentioned before, with the service manual, it's telling us what the voltages should be at these different points. So that's the next thing I need to do, is go ahead and take my meter here on my scope and just see if I've got the correct voltages. So now I'm going to check some voltages. 
After running the signal into the RCA inputs, the signal was getting to the input of the Phono EQ amp, but coming out right here of these two uh, FETs, they're uh, dual packaged FETs, the signals were different. Then the idea is to go ahead and probably check the voltages. And the great thing about these schematics, many of them, and this is one of them, is that there's voltages that are indicated all through the schematic of what you should expect at all these different points. And as I indicated earlier, I just wanted to say that I ran my CD player into the auxiliary input, which is shown right here, and it operated fine. So this is a way, as I would indicated earlier also, is you can narrow an issue down. By the auxiliary working, that took this whole section here out of it, and it took things like the rectifiers out of it, uh, and it allowed you to say, well, my problem's somewhere in here in the phono section. So, so checking the voltages, that there's two rails. There's a minus 31 and a positive 31 volts that come from this power supply circuitry over here at the right. What I found was that the plus 31 was there. It was like 30, about 32 or so, 32 and a half, which is fine. These are never going to be identical. If it says 31 and you've got 32, 32 and a half volts, that's good. But what I found down here on the minus 31, I had about minus 41. And that's too far off, unless you found out that the other uh, side was minus 41, then you assume your schematic's not correct. But in this case, this was 31, this was about minus 41, so something was wrong there. And what I did, I went over to the left channel, I checked the same voltage, sure enough, it was about minus 32 instead of minus uh, 31, but that's fine. And the same with the rest of these voltages. They were very close on the good side, on the left channel, to what they say they were. The 26 and a half, you know, it was like 24 and a half or 25, et cetera. And, and so they were all very, very close together. But this here was minus 41. And on the left channel, it was about minus, like I said, minus 32 and a half or so. So, I worked my way back over here to the power supply. And that's where I found, coming in from the rectifier board, there's a rectifier board. It comes in with minus 44 volts on the one rail, minus 40, positive 44 volts on the other rail. And what happens is in this power supply circuit, it reduces it to plus 31 volts and minus 31. Up here on the positive side, sure enough, I had the 31 volts, just like it showed up here on the Phono EQ. But down here, this minus 31 was that about minus 41. And so I came back over here to this transistor right here, Q715, which remember again, this is only the left channel they show here. The right channel is identical, except you've got to just add 50 to whatever you see there. So Q715 is actually Q765 for the right channel. And I measured minus 44 here on the collector, over here on this side, though, where you see this little arrow says minus 31, I had minus 41. So what was going on there? And up here, the same thing. I had like minus 40, I had minus 44 here. I had minus 44 here. According to the schematic, I should have about minus 31.8. And down here, I should have minus 31 volts. So I had 44 
44 and 40, about 42 here. So that's, something's wrong there. But even if you're not sure if that's right, I came up here to the positive rail and I measured Q704, which was actually Q754, because again, you got to add 50 to this. And sure enough, it was almost identical to what the schematic said. Had 44 volts here, had 31 over here. All right, so that told me that absolutely something's wrong down here. So that's probably why over here the phono section's having an issue because the power supply is not supplying the correct voltage. So then I went in to troubleshoot that and to find out what's going on in this section of the uh, power supply. Okay, I've removed Q765, which on the schematic is Q715 because again, they only show you the left channel and you just have to add 50 to get the designations for the right channel. So this is a 2SA671. And I'm going to hook my peak transistor tester. It's also a FET tester. And it would be the emitter and the collector are shorted together. So, he's one problem. A, a lot of times when you have one component that's bad, you have other ones that are bad also in the area. Okay, I just removed uh, Q764 um, and just going to test it out, make sure it's okay and it didn't get damaged. Uh, 2SA 893. So let's just see what it does, and I'll test it here with my transistor tester. Well, he's bad. Uh, according to this, whether you can see that or not, all three leads are shorted together. So, uh, needless to say, this still wasn't going to work correctly, even if I replaced the, the one transistor. So now, though, now I'm going to have to do some more checking here. 7, 12, and 13, and the two FETs, 709 and 16. I guess I better, I better check them also. Now I'm going to test Q713, which uh, is the left channel designation uh, for uh, this transistor, but it's actually 763 for the right channel, which is what I'm working on. And again, this is a 2SA893. I'm not going to show you my peak transistor tester because it wasn't needed for this transistor. Take a look at this one. You can tell that one's bad. You don't need any test equipment to tell you that. It blew the back right off of it. So Q763 is also bad in this power supply. So there's three transistors. And now I'll go ahead and test the other components and see if I've got more than these three. It's not a big deal, really, right? And, and this is how you learn again. You, you know me, I'm a hobbyist. I'm not a professional. So this is how I've learned by working on them. I was going to just throw the one transistor back in that I knew was bad. And now, because I've been there before, I've replaced things and had them blow up again on me. You've got more than one bad component in here. So I'm going to work through the rest of those transistors and... Uh, see how many bad ones I've got. I didn't find any other defective components, so that was good. But I did have three uh, bad transistors, and I'm gonna replace those, and then see if our power supply section's working, and seeing if we're getting that uh, minus 31 volts instead of uh, minus 41 volts. And then if that looks good, then I'm going to see if that right channel uh, in the phono uh, section is working correctly now. Replacing those three transistors did the trick. I now have minus 32 volts instead of minus 41 volts. Uh, I should have minus 31, but 32. Uh, that'll work fine. 
Then I went ahead and real quick hooked the turntable back up just to make sure that uh, that was working. And sure enough, now we've got a right channel. So that was, uh, that felt good. Felt good to know that uh, both the left and the right channels were working. And now it's time to move on and to keep moving along on this project. I'm making some progress on it. There's been a lot in here that was wrong and it takes some time to get everything straightened out, but heading in the right direction. Before continuing on with the restoration, I want to talk to you about electrolytic capacitors and specifically about the electrolytic capacitors that nowadays are made in China and what that means. If you want to know if you should replace electrolytic capacitors or not, I ask you folks, please Google electrolytic capacitor lifespan and research it yourself and you decide what you should do. But with that being said, I want to touch on another base that has to do with electrolytic capacitors. Uh, not if you change them or not, but there's a lot of controversy about where they're made nowadays, which is for the most part China. And a lot of people say everything out of China is junk. Some of it is. It is junk. Some of it isn't. And it's not because it's made in China. It has mostly to do most products with the cost of it. You know, if you go out to the flea market and you buy six sponges for your kitchen and you pay a dollar and they each only last a few washes, what do you expect? You paid a dollar. You're not going to get much, but there's a lot of high quality products that are made in China. Look at every Apple product is made in China. And by most accounts, you can like or dislike Apple, but they make some wonderful, wonderful products. And those are all made in China, but they're not a dollar, are they? They're quite expensive. And that pretty much is what you'll find goes along with the quality of the products made in China. If they're cheap, generally they're cheap. And if they cost a little bit more, uh, they're generally pretty good. And that goes across the board, not just in electronics, but in anything. So my stance on this is, yes, you buy Nishikan, you buy Panasonic, you buy all these different brands of capacitors that used to be made in Japan, and now they're made somewhere else, and the majority of the time they are made in China. From my standpoint, it's the company that's behind the product being made in China. I have every confidence that those products in China are made just as well as they would have been made here in the United States or here or over in Japan, either one. But you've got to make your own mind up about that. But generally speaking, I just think it's overblown. And us here in the United States, everybody will say the same thing. Well, I'd buy, you know, just buy American stuff. Don't buy, don't buy products made in China. And when it comes down to it, though, what do we all do? We buy products made in China. Almost all of you watching me right now, you're watching me on a Chinese product. Almost every single one of you. I, I, I would bet every single one of you, no matter where you are in the world, uh, China is in that product you're watching me on. So if that were the case, all of us would just buy Australian or buy German, or in my case in the US, buy American. Everybody says that, but when it comes down to it, we want the best product for the money, right? It's just the way it works. If, if I'm here in the United States and something costs $10 and something made in China that's just as good costs $3, I'm buying the Chinese one. And everybody will say, oh, I'd buy it for $10 if it was made in my country. Baloney. Baloney. And that's why we're in the situation we're in. You can say, well, that's, that's bad, you know, and it put people out of work like here in the U.S. And, and around the rest of the world. But that's the way it is. It's just the way it is. So my point is, I believe that the capacitors that are made today are better 
than the ones that were made 50 years ago in Japan. Not manufactured better, they're manufactured just as well, but just the tolerances, the manufacturing processes have gotten, have gotten better. Just like in a lot of things, they've just gotten better. And so this, this general feeling that some people have that if it says made in China, it's junk, I just think it's baloney. I just do. It's not that we can't make good products here in the U.S. or wherever you're watching me in other parts of the world, but in China they're making a buck or two an hour, and here in the United States somebody would be expecting to make 15 or $20 an hour. Well, figure it out. It's going to be cheaper to make it in China. It just is. So anyway, I wanted to I've never shared that with you, that part of it, because for many years these replacement capacitors that I've been using have been made in China. And over the last decade or so, I haven't had any failures. I haven't had any failures of them. Now, a decade, 10 years is 10 years. 50 years is 50 years. What's going to happen down the road? But I'm betting that these components are going to last just as long because companies like Panasonic are not going to allow wherever their product's made for junk to be made. They're just not, but they just can't afford to make them where they used to, where it's, whether it's either here in the States or it's in Japan or wherever. And now actually they're talking about getting out of China and going to places like Vietnam because China's too expensive. But anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. As far as changing electrolytic capacitors, I think it's, it's mandatory to do it. After 15, 20 years, they're all starting to fail. And as I said, Google that electrolytic capacitor lifespan, and you're going to find out that all the manufacturers are going to tell you the same thing, that a 50-year-old electrolytic capacitor, you just live it on borrowed time. You may think it's fine. It's not. You know, it's not. It doesn't mean that one can't last that long. They do. But you're, uh, you're pushing it. So I don't want to go on and on here, but I, I've never gone on and on about this particular uh, made in China thing. Seeing that I'm done talking about electrolytic capacitors, I'm going to go ahead and change out the electrolytic capacitors in this uh, Sony preamplifier and get that done. What you should do, if you got any wires they're close to the spots that you're going to be either soldering or unsoldering. Give yourself plenty of room so you don't damage any of that insulation. And as you can see, this uh, desoldering tool, once again, I just, uh, just pull them right on out of the top there. Uh, this tool just makes this job extremely easy and then I'll just put the new capacitors in. I just want to mention again about being careful of the wiring underneath. Uh, the best thing to do if there's any tie wraps go ahead and clip those loose. No big deal to put that back together when you're done because in this unit there's quite a bit of wiring under the solder side of this unit and you're going to be in there changing those electrolytic capacitors and you want to give yourself as much room as possible and I can tell you from experience you want to do that because you touch your soldering iron or that desoldering tool on any of these pieces of insulation on these wires and it just instantly melts it. See, this gives me some more slack now. It's only two cables that are like that. It looks like there's some small wiring here that's also down under this little holder. Uh, this may give me a little bit more, more room. But I should have enough. I mean, that's usually the case. What you have to do... Uh, these cables, like everything else, they're, they're durable and everything. 
but you don't want to go back and forth with these over and over and over and over because like any wire what's going to happen you're going to end up busting a wire and it's not the end of the world for you to solder it back on but if you're careful with these uh, a lot of times you just don't bend them too much you uh, won't break a wire and everything will work out uh, just like you'd hoped it would these were kind of tucked under this little lip of the chassis here and as showed you before these were tie wrapped and I just moved them out of the way some but you want to give yourself enough room in here because if you don't inevitably you're gonna touch your soldering iron up against one of these wires the insulation and now I'm gonna work down in this section of the board so I've taken the wires down in here and just kind of pushed them out. Usually you can get enough slack. It's tight. There's no doubt about it. It's pretty tight in here. But you get enough slack and if you're careful, you can get down in here. And again, I'll mention it, my uh, HACO desoldering tool makes this so much easier than having to bring a soldering iron and a solder sucker or whatever you're using this device here just makes it so much easier to just get straight down in because you go straight down you probably can't really see the tip on this but maybe you can a little bit on the end here and this will go right over that pin that's sticking through this board and you put it straight down onto the board and it sucks the solder right out. So, you know, if you're careful here, right, I move this with my finger a little bit, I can get right down in there if I'm careful. Again, this whole section here is hot, so I can't lean it up against the wires. If you ever get serious into this hobby or any type of electronics restoration, I guarantee you, you'll look back if you ever purchase one of these or something like it and say, <laughs> Why'd I wait so long? So I'm going to try to show you here uh, how easy this is to get these components out with this tool. There's a hole in the end of this tool, and this hole goes right over that old capacitor leg that's sticking out. And then it melts the solder, and as you're pushing down slightly, it gets right down onto that eyelet. So I'm going to try to show you this and see if I can all right I mean that just did a, a wonderful job of cleaning that hole out of solder I don't know if you can see it on the camera or not but it looks like a brand new board it looks like a legs coming up from a brand new component so I'm gonna put this guy down here for a second and try to pick the unit up and the capacitor show you the capacitor just fell right out of the bottom I believe <laughs> we'll see Let me... and uh, there he is there's the surprise right it's right there so I mean doesn't that just show you the tool again makes the job so much easier now the only thing you do you do have some maintenance on this now you can use it all day long but at the end of the day you need to clean it there's a small filter in here that you need to replace and this little tube here is what's really collecting the solder and it'll collect quite a bit as I said you could go all day long here easily soldering unsoldering I should say hundreds of connections if not even more than that before you would have to maintain this but after you're done with it every day uh, just clean it out and uh, it'll it'll work perfect for you the next time you use it so I got those 45 year old electrolytic capacitors changed out as you saw earlier I had to change three bad transistors that was causing a power supply problem so now I thought I go over where I got the parts for this unit. Some folks aren't sure where to get parts for these old vintage units and for the most part the parts are still available or the equivalent parts are. Maybe not the exact same part number that was used back in the day but there's an equivalent for them. 
The only issues that you have with vintage equipment, certain parts are very difficult to get and you won't be able to order them easily, which are parts like the power transformers, cosmetic things like knobs, face plates, that type of thing, chassis parts. Those are difficult to find because they were specific to a particular unit. But most of these units that were built back in the day used similar components. So it doesn't matter if you've got a Pioneer, a Sansui, a Kenwood, or like in this case, a Sony. They used the same parts of the day. And most of those are still available. So right now I'd like to show you a little bit about where to find parts for a unit like the Sony preamplifier, but also for your particular piece of equipment. I'm also going to show you which parts to use, how to pick a particular capacitor for a particular piece of equipment, along with talking about the transistors and how to find substitutes for transistors that maybe are no longer available. Let me show you first where to get the parts and then once I show you those sites then I'm going to show you which particular parts that you should use in your repair or restoration of your vintage stereo equipment. Here in the United States I use one of two parts distributors. One is Mauser Electronics and the other one is DigiKey Electronics. They're very similar. They carry the same products. If one is out of a part, I may order from the other. They're very, very similar. So for what I'm going to go through, I'm going to just pick one of them. And I'm going to pick Mauser because if I can show you how to maneuver through Mauser's website, you'll be able to maneuver through DigiKey's website. So here I am at Mauser.com. And first of all, I'm going to go through to show you how you would find capacitors. Because capacitors, they're the number one failure point in vintage audio equipment or vintage electronics in general. And if you see over here on the left hand side, there's a category products. And if you just scroll down, you'll see passive components. And if you come over here where that arrow shows and you come up a little bit, you'll see capacitors. And so you just click on that link and geez, you're in capacitors that, that easy and that quick. Now the problem is, right, there's over 800,000 of them. Whoops. So you're thinking, well, how am I going to find what I need in 800,000 uh, pieces of, uh, of electronics? And this is just capacitors. This isn't the rest of the stuff they carry. So it can be daunting, but like just like working on the stereo equipment, you get used to maneuvering around and what you want to do is break this down into smaller units to make it manageable. So what we're looking for are aluminum electrolytic capacitors. And if we click that link, we're down to a under 100,000 now. We've got 93,000. You still think that's crazy, and it is crazy. You've still got to narrow it down because you'd never find what you wanted in a list of 93,000 pieces of uh, electronics. So if you look here, they have types of electrolytic capacitors. They have axial, which are the capacitors that sit horizontally that have a lead coming out each side of them, which you use a few of those in vintage electronics. Not as many though as these ones right down below it. The radial, the radial capacitors right here. And those are the ones that use the standard ones you see, like here in this picture. The ones that both leads come out the bottom of the capacitor. So we can narrow it down a lot more here just by clicking that. You'll see it says 32,000 because they have all different kinds of capacitors for SMD, screw type, snap in, but we want radial. So we're going to click those. And now 
you see a big menu open up, even larger. And down here now, what we can do is go ahead and narrow it down even more. And so first of all, I want to tell you the first thing you want to do is come down here and click on In Stock. Because the most frustrating thing is for you to do all this work to find a part and then you find out it's not in stock. So I just click the in stock and you can see it narrowed it down to 9,600 from 32,000. And so anytime you make a change, you want to click this button that says apply filters. So we'll click that. And now there's that 9668 remaining. So all we've done is narrowed it down from over 800,000 parts to under 10,000. We're getting there. Uh, so next, I've talked a lot about Nishikon, right? I use them quite often. Panasonic's great. Rubicon. There's so many. And if you scroll down through here, here's Elna, which was in a lot of vintage equipment. Every Sansui I've got was filled with Elna capacitors. They're still in business. A lot of these companies were making components for your vintage equipment 50 years ago. So what I'm going to do is narrow it down to one particular brand. You don't have to pick Nishikon. You can pick Panasonic. You can pick Rubicon. You can pick Elna. If you've got your favorite, go ahead and pick it. They're all here in the list. But I'm going to pick Nishikon. And as soon as we click that and go ahead and apply filters again, we're down to 3,600. So now we're getting to the point where we can start to find the components we're looking for. And if you notice here under product, it has audio grade, bipolar, general purpose, high temperature, low impedance, low leakage. So I talk, I'm going to go through one particular series. I talk a lot like when I rebuild a power supply, which, which is probably the most important section of any vintage piece of electronics to get rebuilt is that power supply. And I talk about a lot about using what I call and what Nishikon calls PW series capacitors for a power supply. They may not be the capacitor you use all through your unit, but PW series capacitors are a standard in power supplies in vintage audio equipment. So how do you find them? Well, you can go through this category here if you know that the capacitor is either an audio grade, a low impedance, a low leakage, but let's just say you don't know what the heck it is. If you scroll all the way across here to the end, almost, they have every series that Nishikon makes. And they all start with a U, but as I mentioned, it's PW series. So you have a series here, and we're looking for PW. So I scroll down, and right there is UPW, and that's what we want. So once again, you click on that, you apply the filter. Now we're down to 278. You can see how this just walks along, though. At first, you're going to be confused. There's no doubt. Just like you're going to be confused the first time you try to work on your piece of equipment. There's no doubt about it. it, it it's confusing at first. But after you do this a few times, you can kind of see as you step along, it's something that you can do and then figure it out. And now all of a sudden you can say, well, I got PW series Nishikons and I'm rebuilding my power supply. Now, what capacitance do I need? What voltage do I need? All that information's right in here in these different sliders. Some of them you have to slide down to see all of the different options. You really don't have to worry much about, they give you a ton of detail here. Diameter, lead spacing, length, you know, lifespan, ripple current, etc., etc. But you've already decided you're gonna use these PW series 
because for years they've been used in vintage audio equipment successfully. And so you can't go wrong with them in a power supply in a piece of vintage electronics. So I'm going to just pick one here. Let's say we're looking for a thousand microfarad capacitor. And we click that. You can see every time I click this, this category in, in red changes. So now it says there's 12. But remember, you've always, if you want this to actually apply, you have to hit this apply filters. So I'm going to hit apply filters. And now this turns to 12. So there are 12 in stock, 12 different, 12 different part numbers that meet this criteria. But what else do we need with an electrolytic capacitor? We need to know the voltage. And most of the time in solid state, vintage audio equipment, power supplies, you're going to be using 100 volt, maybe 50 volt. you're going to be using either 50 or 100 volt capacitors. A lot of times it's 100 volt in receivers and amplifiers. Now in this Sony preamp I'm working on, the highest voltage in it is 44 volts. So all of the electrolytic capacitors are 50, are, are, none of them are higher than 50 volts. Their rating. But in a receiver or an amplifier, many times the voltages are going to be higher. They're going to be 60, 70, 80 volts. So you need a hundred, you need a voltage rating that's going to be at least equal to the one you're taking out and hopefully a little bit more. So now we've narrowed down over 800,000 selections down to 12 which makes it a much easier to figure out um, what we need. So I'm going to go ahead and just take the 50 volt uh, rated capacitor. So now I've got a thousand microfarad, 50 volt, and the results remaining are down now to one. And if we apply the filter, well, there's the component. So we finally made it from over 800,000 components down to one, the one we're looking for. And there's all kinds of information in here. There's data sheets. There's all kinds of stuff. And I won't go over everything that's available here. I'll leave it up to you guys if you're interested to go look at it. But I just wanted to show you how you found one individual capacitor. And this is how you do it. And when you need something else, you use the same menus, you do the same thing. And once you get the hang of this, it goes pretty quick. It can go pretty quick for you. You know, once you know what you need and you can see what's in stock and you can see the prices and there's a, uh, there's a spot to put how many in that you want. And, you know, it's not that difficult, but as I said, at first it's pretty daunting. So I hope this helped you out to be able to maneuver through a website like Mauser to find parts that you need. And once you do it, as I mentioned, once you do it a few times, it'll just become second nature and it's really not that difficult. When I started this section talking about where to find electrolytic capacitors, I mentioned talking about which ones to choose, but I thought it was important to tell you how to find them. So I went ahead and told you that first because it's great that you know which ones to purchase, but then where do you purchase them and how do you purchase them? So now I'm going to go over what I feel, and this is my personal feeling, of what you should use in your vintage stereo equipment. There's no one size fits all, first of all, but just in general, the simplest way to approach working on a piece of vintage audio equipment. So you can have a minimal amount of parts, but still get an excellent repair or restoration out of it. So I'm gonna go ahead and tell you about those parts and where to use them and which ones I think that you should use. There are many choices with electrolytic capacitors and that's what makes it somewhat confusing and I'm going to try to make it less confusing for any of you guys that are trying to get together 
some parts to do a restoration on your vintage equipment or a repair and I've used just about every brand and I won't say every series of capacitor because there's you know there's literally hundreds if not thousands of those but I've used a lot of different ones and I've come to the conclusion that it's just better to pick a brand whatever brand you you like a lot of times I go to Nishikon or Panasonic or Elna but if I were gonna pick one I do Nishikon with a maximum of three different series of capacitors and I'm not really I, and I be honest with you you can get by with one series of capacitors as I indicated before the PW series capacitors are great for power supplies that could be one series that you'd use and their KL series is an excellent capacitor that could be used just about everywhere else and frankly it could be used everywhere else you would not even need what they call audio grade capacitors but I use them I use audio grade for any type of a capacitor that's in the signal path I do use that but I've done plenty of projects without quote audio grade capacitors could I hear the difference no so I'm just telling you to make it simple if I, if I had to pick one capacitor uh, I would probably pick the KL series on Nishikons but what you should do is in a power supply use the PW series everywhere else you can use the KL series and if you want to get like I get in the signal path you would use an audio grade capacitor so you'd have three different series and actually what do I do all the time if you guys watch my videos I almost always change out the small electrolytic the small value electrolytics that are in the signal path with film capacitors those one microfarad two microfarad capacitors that are in the signal path I, I use film capacitors now have I ever heard a difference no and and what I'm trying to do here is to make this simple so you don't have a ton of parts to try to find so I would say the KL series is a great overall capacitor that will be much better than the ones you're taking out of your 50 or 60 year old uh, piece of stereo equipment I wanted to say once again that I haven't been able to hear the difference in sound quality between different types of capacitors I just haven't you may be able to someone else may be able to I haven't been able to so I wanted to make that clear too it's not just trying to keep it simple but it's also I've really never gotten any benefit from my experience doesn't mean you're not going to I'm not telling you not to buy a lot of different capacitors like I have and experiment but I've never used one particular type of electrolytic capacitor and said wow is that different does that sound great compared to another one so now that I've said that some of you out there are probably thinking well why are you changing them out then well the main reason is because electrolytic capacitors have a limited lifespan and it's for the reliability of the equipment I've seen the damage that old electrolytic capacitors can do to vintage electronics and it is by far the electrolytic capacitor is by far the number one cause of failure in old electronics bar none and when I speak of failure it doesn't mean that your equipment smoked on you it doesn't mean that you push the power button and the fuse blew that's not necessarily the only failure mode that these capacitors go into I would wager to bet that most people that have a particular piece of equipment that they don't like that sounds terrible has to do with dried up old electrolytic capacitors so if you've got a pioneer that sounds terrible or a Sansui or a Marantz or any brand and it's an old vintage piece of equipment it probably just needs to be restored to get back to sound like it used to and maybe you've got another piece of equipment that's aged better and sounds better to you 
But if there is a huge difference between the sounds of any piece of equipment from this era, there's something wrong with it. It doesn't mean there's not synergy. I believe in that. I believe certain pieces of equipment get together and can sound better or sound worse. Certain speakers just seem to sound better with certain pieces of electronics. I'm all with that. It's people who have a piece of equipment that just sounds terrible. They just say, my Marantz is just terrible. My Sansui sounds great. My Pioneer sounds great. It probably has to do with these electrolytic capacitors. It can be other things too. It's not just that. There's also many transistors that are known to be noisy and can cause different issues, level issues. And But most of the time, if you've got a piece of vintage electronics that sounds terrible, terrible, there's something wrong with it. It wasn't built that way. There's so many reasons to restore your old audio equipment and get those electrolytic capacitors out that are just aging and are failing in various ways. Some are blowing up, some are just failing slowly, but they all have one thing in common. They're all going to fail someday and this equipment's old enough now where they're starting to fail much quicker than they did 10 or 20 years ago. In very few years, most pieces of vintage audio equipment will not be operating. And today, most of the pieces are not operating up to their specifications because of these old electrolytic capacitors. But you've got to make that decision for yourself, as I do. You've got to do your own research and you decide whether you want to keep that piece of audio equipment and have it running at its best. So I'm going to move on now to the transistors. The transistors in vintage audio equipment for the most part are no longer available. The exact part number. But fortunately 99% of the time there are modern equivalents available and as you saw in the restoration on this preamplifier I had three bad transistors none of which are still in production but also none of the three were difficult to find substitutions for so that's the good thing so what you want to do is go ahead and Google transistor substitution list is you're going to have to do a lot more research to find what you need and again it's not that difficult there's many people that have come before you that have had to repair this old equipment and they've found suitable substitutes it's just that you can't go to a big site like Mauser like I showed you with the capacitors and find these transistors the hard part is finding out what modern transistor will replace your defective vintage transistor. But once you've done that, it's easy enough to order it from Mauser or DigiKey, just like the capacitors. So I hope showing you the process that I go through when I do a restoration or repair will help you with your piece of equipment. You don't have to have a Sony TAE88B preamplifier. The process is the same no matter what. If you have a receiver, a tuner, an amplifier, whatever it happens to be, you've got to find a source for those electrolytic capacitors that you want to change out in a restoration. You want to be able to find transistors if you have bad ones like I did in this case. So I wanted to show you that because this process works for any piece of equipment. So hopefully it helped you guys out when you go about to try to attempt a restoration or repair on your vintage audio gear. I'm not going to show you every capacitor that I changed out in this unit. You guys know I went through and did that. And you know I had to get in there and troubleshoot those three bad transistors. But now I'm going to continue on with the restoration because there's no need to show you guys each individual component being changed out. I spent quite a bit of time about trying to show you how I pick components and what components you should pick. So let's continue on with the restoration of the Sony TAE88B preamplifier.
As you saw earlier in this video, a big part of this restoration has been dealing with those rotary switches that I've shown earlier that I had to remove and take them apart. You can't just spray deoxid in these like you can in many switches in a piece of vintage audio equipment. As I showed earlier, I worked on the output level uh, switches. I worked on the monitor switch. I worked on the phono switch. But I also knew I had a problem with the mode switch. I would lose the left channel, lose the right channel. It acted a lot like you would in a standard piece of old vintage audio gear that needed its switches cleaned. So I had to take that mode switch out. And I'm not going to show you all, everything about the mode switch because I showed you that in the output level switch, the phono switch, and the monitor switch. What I do want to show you though, I did a little bit of experimenting to show you a little bit better of a view of that little switch itself, the inner workings of that switch, because the service manual doesn't show you any of that. I, they didn't expect anybody to take these apart back in the day, the switches themselves. You would have just ordered a whole switch and said the heck with this. You would have called Sony and their service center would have sent out a switch to your site and you'd be all set to go. But in today's world, you got to take it apart. As you know, my motivation here with these videos, part of it anyway, is to help somebody who has this particular unit or maybe another Sony unit that uses the same type of rotary switches to make it easier to repair it. So what I've done here, I'm showing how that little connector moves up and down on that plate. And hopefully that shows you a little bit more what's going on in the switch. I didn't show that before because I wasn't sure how I could show that well. And I think I showed it pretty good here. So I'm not going to go through and show you the rest of it. All these switches, they take the same thing to fix. So. If you look at the if you look at what I did earlier in the video, it'll fit this mode switch the exact same way. I just wanted to show you guys a little more detail with this mode switch that I didn't show when I was working on the other switches earlier in the video. Depending what position that cam's in would depend what position this little bar's in. And let's see if I can swing him around. And you can see those three pins that actually go down. These three pins here that actually go down into the circuit board. And so that's the way this switch works. I did the same process on the mode switch that I did on the other ones. I disassembled it, cleaned it, and then reassembled and reinstalled uh, the switch. And it worked fine. Work good now, nice and solid. Uh, no intermittent stuff happening there. You move it to each position and it worked great. So now I'm going to move on to that phono section again. I touched on it a little while ago about how I thought I had it repaired and I ended up fixing the uh, power supply problem. So I thought it was all uh, fixed up. Well, I tested a little bit closer and it wasn't. And one of the things that I mentioned way back early was a jumper wire that was on Phono 2. You may recall it was quite a while ago, but I showed the wire that somebody had put in there to, uh, I think, just get it going. And that wasn't the only additional issue with the phono section. When I removed both of the phono switches from the, uh, from the preamp, you know, there's a right and a left one, so there's two individual switches. On the one nearest the face of the unit, someone had wrote front on the front of the switch, and the switch at the rear of the unit which is the right channel, somebody had wrote rear. So these switches had been out before. And when they were out, it looks like deoxid was sprayed on them. 
because they were just coated with something. When I disassembled them, there was a lot of cleanup to do, which I think was deoxit, which really didn't fix the issue that um, the switches had with those things being gummed up like that. So I cleaned that up. I rebuilt the switches, as I said. I put them back in, and this is when the wire was still in there, and the phono would not work intermittently one channel or the other. I could move the knob at the front a little bit to the left or the right, and it would it would work, then it wouldn't work, then it would work, then it wouldn't work. I could turn it coming in from the left side, it might work, turn it coming in from the right side. So Phono 1 and Phono 2 weren't totally working. I thought they were. When I got the power supply going, I was so excited that I just continued on, right? Well, after I checked it out a little bit closer, I knew I had a, another issue. And what that issue was, was uh, apparently those cams were moved slightly. These cams, in these switches, they have to be pretty exact where you position those cams. There's not a lot of wiggle room. You don't need a micrometer, don't get me wrong, but you got to be pretty darn close. I just wanted to share that so anyone who's working on this unit or on a unit that has similar controls to make sure those cams are lined up exactly perfect or you could have intermittent issues with your switches and your various switch settings. And make sure you go to hifienginecom and get the service manual for this unit because it's got details in it that you'll need if you have to take apart these specialized switches. Now finally, I can put these switches behind me. I knew nothing about them before I started this project. Now I know more than I probably want to know about them. After taking all the switches out of this unit and reworking them, I'm pretty confident they'll work for years now without any issues. There's still another issue. Remember that yellow jumper wire? And that was in there because the artworks broke. So I've got to fix that artwork. So that's the next project to take on. So this broken artwork runs from the RCA jack of the phono input on the preamp down to the switch assembly. You could run a wire straight from the RCA jack right to the switch if you wanted to, but what I'm going to do is to just put a little jumper in right there on that land, including wire. You gotta have some wire if you're gonna go ahead and fix uh, the land. You need some flux, some no clean flux, and also some soldering mask. Along with that, you're going to need a sharp knife, and you're gonna also maybe need a pair of tweezers or something like that uh, to hold on to the wire, because you're gonna scrape along that land and expose some of that copper. Then you're gonna use the flux to go ahead and give you a nice soldering area. You'll lay down some flux and some solder. That'll give that wire a spot where you can solder it right onto the land. I'm just going to show you an overview of how I repaired this artwork. I'm not going to go into details because there's a lot of good videos up here on YouTube about how to repair these traces that have been damaged in some way. It's not just unique to vintage audio equipment, it's vintage electronics in general. So there's a lot of folks who don't necessarily work on vintage audio equipment like I do, but they may work on some other sort of vintage electronics, like old computers or what have you, but you've got the same issues. I'm just showing you just generally what you do, but if you want details, just search up here on YouTube for repairing artwork, and you'll find some wonderful videos about how to do it in detail and from people that are much better at it than I am. People who do it every day and really some incredible uh, work that they do. You can repair the artwork in these. It's not that difficult and the, and the great thing about the internet age is 
We all have that information right at our fingertips. You just do a search up here on YouTube. It's probably the best place if you've got some artwork that needs to be fixed. This was quite a long video, but it gave me the opportunity to show you a lot of different fixes for a lot of different problems. A lot of times you have one of these issues, two of these issues in, in a piece of equipment, but not too often do you have such a wide variety of issues as I did with this uh, preamplifier. So I hope it taught you something. After spending time listening to this preamplifier, it's one of the best sounding that I have, if not the best sounding. It really is outstanding in its performance. And I have a couple moving coil cartridges. As I indicated in the video, this preamplifier handles those quite well. Every time I hook it up, I'm nothing but impressed by it. So it was well worth the time for me to get this preamplifier up and running correctly. And you learn a lot from projects like this. When you have problems, you learn something. So the next time, it may not be exactly the same issues as the next piece of equipment I work on, but you gain a little bit of confidence because you got through this one. If you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up down below. For you non-subscribers, I'd really appreciate a subscription. And for my present subscribers, as always, thank you so much.